Welcome everyone to the fifth and final in this current webinar series. My name is Marie Latulipe and I work with ILSI North America. This series is brought to you in collaboration with the American Society for Nutrition and what we're doing is exhibiting the ongoing work of both the faculty and students at the University of Illinois and all of this work is focusing on the gut brain axis and the gut microbiome. So just the usual reminder that everyone is on mute, but please use the chat function to type in your questions throughout the webinar and we will get to those um, at the end of the session. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so barring any um, need to, to mute unpublished data, we will be pub publishing that on our website, so please go there. Um, a little bit about ILSI North America, if you're not familiar with the organization, we focus on nutrition and food safety science for the benefit of the public's health. Uh, we always like to remind people that we don't lobby and we don't do any advocacy, but we focus on developing science. And the way we work is that the intellectual contributions of scientists from industry, government, and academia are joined together with pooled industry funding to address um, scientific issues that are of common concern across those sectors. So we just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, our audience today is reflective of that tripartite network that we have and the approach that we take to all of our work. If you'd like to learn more about the organization, please visit us on one of these platforms that you see here. Uh, and with that, I think we can just go right into our event today. And I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sharon Donovan. Dr. Donovan is a professor in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition, and is also a member of the Division of Nutritional Sciences and the Institute for Genomic Biology. She was actually recently named the director of the Personalized Nutrition Initiative at Illinois, and she was also a member of the 2020 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. So with that, we will turn the platform over to you, Dr. Donovan. Thank you, Marie, and, and thank you for the opportunity to present some of our exciting data at the University of Illinois. As um, was just mentioned, we have recently launched a personalized nutrition initiative at the university that I'm directing. So I want to just put in a little shameless plug. If you're interested in learning more about that, we'll be having a a webinar next um, Tuesday, the 29th at noon, and I'll be providing an introduction, and then Dr. Hannah Holscher and Dr. Naman Khan will be um, presenting some of their research. So if you're interested in that, you can find out, just Google um, IGB Science Chat at University of Illinois. Turning off my, my webcam. So today's presentation, I will be providing an introduction to our Strong Kids cohort and talk about some of our research, primarily in the first year of life, on how early life nutrition is impacting the gut microbiome and trajectories. And then I'll be turning it over to my colleague, Naman Khan, who will be presenting his work on the intersection between obesity, health behaviors, and childhood cognitive health. And then we'll be turning over at the end to Arden McMath, who is a doctoral student supported by our USA National Needs that Dr. Khan and I are co-advising. And she'll be presenting some of her initial findings as well as her longer term goals, where we'll be um, looking at that interse intersection of the gut brain microbiome in our Strong Kids cohort. So first I'd like to just introduce our team. And so this is a very transdisciplinary team made up of faculty in food science and human nutrition, human development and family studies, and Barbara Fies and I are the co-PIs on the project. Um, Dr. Khan in kinesiology, Dr. Tran Garcia in College of Medicine and Extension, our wonderful support um, staff and, and visiting um, researchers, and plus I'd have to say an army of undergraduates who without their help, this would not be possible. And then of course we have to, you know, thank our participants who without them, we wouldn't have any data to present today. Also, this is a very much a public private partnership in terms of the funding. And I really need to acknowledge the support of the National Dairy Council, which has supported the cohort and then funding from NIH and USDA that's helped to support students and, and analyses, as well as 
funding through the Food and Family Program um, by the Family Resiliency Center with funding from the Christopher Family Foundation and also the Gerber Foundation. So to, to jump right in on the development of the gut microbiome, I think, I think we've all heard over the last decade about the fact that our bodies harbor diverse, complex, and abundant microbiota. We know the composition is influenced by many factors, and as I'll show you during early life is a particularly critical time for establishing that microbiota and getting it sort of off on the right foot. We know from preclinical and clinical evidence that the gut microbiota is essential for normal immune and metabolic gastrointestinal and cognitive development and function. A lot of this evidence has been from germ-free animals so that we know in the complete absence of a microbiome that none of these systems develop normally. Um, but we also have some clinical evidence from humans to show that dysbi dysbioses in particular um, times or diseases can affect these, these functions. And as I mentioned, really the first thousand day days of life is a critical time. So as we see, there's these are just a summary of some of the early life factors. So we have maternal factors that are acting even prenatally. We have the postnatal factors, including exposure to antibiotics, early life nutrition, um, genetics, and the environment. And then if we look at you know, more of the infant components, so how that infant is delivered, either vaginally or C-section, plays a role in the initial seeding. I oftentimes talk about this as seeding and feeding. So we have then how that infant is being fed in terms of are they breastfed or formula fed? What happens when we begin to add complementary or solid foods? And then that important transition to more of an adult type diet. And we're learning a lot more in this area. Again, a lot of the microbiome data is, is descriptive and associative, but we are moving towards a better understanding of um, mechanisms of action between the hosts and the microbes. So then jumping into the STRONG kids. So STRONG kids stands for the Synergistic Theory and Research on Nutrition and Growth Project. And this is a birth cohort that's investigating how individual biology interacts with the family environment to promote healthy eating habits and growth trajectories in young children. It's a longitudinal birth cohort of, um, we started with about 468 families and we currently have funding through seven years of age and it was established in 2013. And the basis for the Strong Kids is what we call the six C's model where we're really taking a very interdisciplinary and, and cross um, speciation in a way, looking all the way from the cell, which is, includes SNPs and microbiome to the child, to the clan or the family, the community and the country. So our you know, transdisciplinary team is, is working across all of these levels and we're particularly interested in being able to, to move across disciplines. So looking at how the microbiome is affecting temperament, how that's being impacted by the family chaos and things like that. So this shows the data collection. So we have five time points in the first year of life, one week, six weeks, three months, one month after the introduction of solid foods, one year, then 18 months, and then annually thereafter. And we do home visits at all of these time points where we um, collect heights and weights of both the mother and the infant. We collect stool samples from the infant um, at all the time points, the child and the mom. We collected at six weeks. We collected a saliva sample from the mother and the infant at six weeks and then added another um, sample from the child at four years. And so we're interested in looking at potential epigenetic changes between the six week and four year time period. We also collected a milk sample and did a 24 hour um, weighing to get um, milk intake at six weeks. So we have a number of biometric measures and we also have a very extensive survey that the parents complete at all of these time points. And this is just a, an idea of some of the, the factors that are on here. And, and the survey ages up. So in early times, we're asking more about breastfeeding. And, and now we're at six and at five and six, we're looking at the transition to school and other factors. So, um, you know, both a combination of qualitative, quantitative, biological data.
this is a description of our, our cohort. So our mothers, um, approximately 31 years of age, predominantly white, non-Hispanic, predominantly married or cohabitating, as is indicative of a college town. We have about 73% are either college grads or post-grads and 70, 69% employed. I think it's important to note that even in this you know, highly educated um, sample, we still had about half of our moms who had a pre-pregnancy BMI that were overweight or obese. And so since one of our major interests is childhood obesity development, we do see that many of um, the moms are in this overweight and obese category. Um, the infants, um, again, 66% firstborn, predominantly white and non-Hispanic. Um, we, we had an exclusion criteria for birth less than 37 weeks or small for gestational age. So our infants were about 40 weeks and, and a normal birth weight and length and about 73% vaginal um, delivery, 27% C-section. So for my part of the presentation, I'm going to be focusing on, on these interactions. So we, you know, infants have a variety of ways they can be fed in the first year of life. They can be exclusively breastfed, exclusively formula fed, or mixed fed, where they're getting, you know, a combination of both um, their own mother's milk and, and formula. We know that these different modes of feeding can impact growth. There's emerging evidence that these different modes of feeding can also impact the gut microbiome. And so we're interested in how the gut microbiome within the context of these different feeding modes is impacting growth. And then also what are the interaction with these other environmental factors that I, I previously described. So this basically shows our infant feeding mode in the first year of life. So we have a, a high percentage of infants who start out exclusively breastfed or combination fed. We have less than 10% that start out on formula. Again, this is a self-selected longitudinal cohort. So we recruited more moms who were interested in breastfeeding. And what surprised me is that we actually maintain a, a pretty high level of exclusive breastfeeding through um, a year, almost about 50% of those babies had never had formula or during that first year of life. So we see in this combination fed again, this is a group where infants may be moving from exclusively breastfed to combination fed or even to formula fed. So we're able to track each individual infant over time as their feeding modes change. But this just gives you an idea of the, the overall cohort. Within the combination fed, there, the mean was actually 50% human milk, 50% formula, but there was a range from 8 to 95% um, human milk. And we do see um, about 5.9 months is the um, age of complementary feeding. Again, AAP recommends um, between four and six months. This slide shows the infant weight for length categories in the first year, so starting at six weeks out to a year, and we see underweight in blue, normal weight um, in orange, overweight and obese based on these percentile categories. And as you see that during this first year, we go from about 14.4% of the infants falling into um, greater than 85th percentile, to up to about 37% by year of age. And we see a big jump here between six and nine months of age. And you know, there's a lot of factors. There's the addition of um, solid foods at this time. We also see more infants moving into daycare outside of the home. Um, so we're, we're very interested in teasing out what some of these factors are. But basically what we're seeing is that in, in the first year within this cohort, the infants are getting heavier, and by year, really none of the infants are, are categorized as underweight. So that was looking at the full cohort. And then when we broke it down by feeding mode, we have breastfed, combined fed, and formula fed. And across the different six weeks, three months, six months, nine months, and a year. And um, these are the Z scores. So again, zero would be a 50th percentile. So what we noticed, though, is that if we compare, for example, the breastfed with the formula fed, 
although the whole cohort was getting heavier, it was um, really the, the babies who were being exclusively formula fed were sort of leading the charge and they were jumping up in their um, weight filling Z score already at six months and then maintaining it. And then these combination fed infants were somewhat intermediate. And you know, this is just through the first um, year. We're now then looking at how these trajectories are carrying out through the second and third year. So another way that we looked at the data was to, to look at growth trajectories, which gave us a, a nice um, idea of how the, these children were growing over that first year. And what we found is that the, the infants um, using a semi-parametric mixed models, we, um, the infants fell into three categories. And, it, and surprisingly, it was about a third of the infants in each category. So we had the, what we call the mid-stable, and these these kids kind of track along the 50th percentile, about a zero weight for length Z-score, you know, throughout the first year of life. We have what we call the mid-high, mid which start out around the 50th, but then experience this very rapid early postnatal growth and end up somewhat plateauing, but still mean, being almost plus two Z-scores at a year. And then we have this group here that um, started out a little bit smaller, minus one, and then kind of slowly um, climbed to being close to the 50th percentile. And I'll come back to the slopes of these lines and these lines later in my presentation, but I'll also talk later about how we looked at how the microbiome differed between these three growth trajectories. So we also found that there were some um, demographic differences in the children that fell into these different trajectories. So the, the gray column shows the overall cohort. And relative to the overall cohort, the, the, the kids in what we call the low late, so they started low and had kind of a late um, surge in growth. There were fewer females and there were a higher proportion of females in the mid-stable. When we looked at race and ethnicity, the kids in that mid-high, so the, the group that showed that really earlier rapid growth, there were fewer non-Hispanic whites and a higher proportion of non-Hispanic um, blacks in that category. And then within the, the low late, we also had a, a higher percentage of those babies that had C-section. So, I mean, these are all sort of demographic um, characteristics that we need to consider when we're looking not only at how um, diet is affecting these growth trajectories. So then we also looked at, at feeding mode, and this is a little bit busy, but we see breastfed in the blue, combined fed in the orange, formula fed in the um, gray, and then this top are infants who were already um, weaned to cow's milk at a year of age. And what we observed was if you look at the mid-stable, which we might say is, is the best kind of um, growth, that more of those infants were exclusively breastfed early on. In the um, low late, in the mid-high, we see relative to the mid-stable that more of the infants had were being exclusively formula fed at six months. And then when we look at this mid-high at 12 months, had the highest amount of um, proportion of infants getting exclusive formula fed, and about 11% had already been weaned to cow's milk, which is not in line with the AAP recommendations to transition to, to cow's milk after a year, and that compared to 3 and 5% in the other groups. So the take-home message is that all three feeding modes were reflected in each growth trajectory, but there were some um, differences in the relative proportions, and these changed over time. So now we're going to shift to the microbiome, and this is sort of, you think about the bird's eye view of the microbial um, composition over the first year. So this is at the phyla level, it's at a fairly high level, but what you see if we look from one week out to a year, that we see this um, sort of progressive reduction in the proportion of bacteria in the phyla proteobacteria. We see a bloom of firmicutes at six months, so after addition of solids, and then the bacteroides and Veruca microbia stay relatively constant 
So then when we <clears throat> look by um, structure, so this is a principal coordinate analysis um, of the sort of what we call beta diversity. And so the previous slide was looking at all of the infants, but what we see when we look at the structure, we see that the breastfed infants are clustering separately from the formula fed and we see that the formula feds tend to cluster more tightly than the other groups and we've, we've seen this in other studies and then we see this is where the the combination infants are falling and what was surprising to me is that they actually cluster more closely to exclusively formula fed infants than they do the breastfed i really thought they would be more intermediate given that on average they were getting half human milk and half formula. Um, again, there's a range, so I think that's why some of these um, are overlapping, but it was really suggesting that you know, any formula was shifting these babies, at least from a microbiome. Actually, we saw the same thing from the metabolomics, fecal metabolomics, that they looked much more similar to formula fed, exclusively formula fed, then exclusively breastfed. So this is going back to the um, looking by feeding group, breast combined and formula at the phyla, genera, and species. And I, I didn't put any names here because I just want you to get a big picture and appreciate again that as we look at these two, the any either any formula or exclusive formula they tend to look more similar to each other than they do the breastfed. And, and also, as you see, when we look at the genus and the species, more diversity, that there's, there's more bars here and more species, and we'll come back to that later. So when then we look statistically to see what were the factors that were affecting this microbiome diversity. And, and basically it was significant over time. So every time point overall was different. Then when we looked at the breastfed versus the formula fed, they were significantly different from each other at all time points. So even after the addition of solids, they, they were significantly different. When we looked at the breastfed versus the combined fed, they were different again at all time points, except this didn't reach the level of significance. And then when we looked at the formula versus the combined fed, they were only different at these early, the first two time points, the one week and the six week, and then they, they were no longer significantly different. So I think that, that this is novel data to really suggest that um, formula is coming in or less breast milk to, to shape the microbiome in, in unique ways. So that was beta diversity. This is what we call alpha diversity. So this is looking at how, how much diversity within a sample and what we observe. So this is going back to our growth trajectory data. So we found that the, these, the babies in this mid high, so again, the ones who showed that early rapid um, growth and ended up being at a higher um, Z-score had a more diverse microbiota at one week six weeks and then six months and oftentimes for adults we think a, a more diverse microbiota is, is healthier and better but if you think about a breastfed infant actually has a really bifido typically the bifido dominant microbiota so in this case in infancy we oftentimes think that having a less diverse microbiota might be better but either way we found that a more diverse microbiota was associated with this, this more rapid early growth trajectory. So then we asked the question, well, what were differences in the infants over time in these trajectories? And the first column shows the, the phyla, genus and species, and then time. And basically what we found is that earlier, um, you can see there's almost all firmicutes except for the acromantia, which is a group of microbia. Earlier and more abundant colonization with firmicutes was, was more common in the infants, statistically more common in infants in this mid-high growth trajectory. So they were being colonized to a greater degree, even at one week of age in Ruminococcus navis, which is, 
A very common commensal microbe in adults, we typically in infants don't see it coming up until after we introduce um, solid foods. So it's, it's rare to see it this early. And you, you almost see this progression as well. So Glaudia also, which is, was previously um, categorized as a ruminococcus, and you start to see clostridial species being more predominant at three months than the acromantia anostypes in another ruminococcus. So in all of these cases, these are more predominant in that really rapid growth trajectory. However, it, this flipped. So ruminococcus navis, all of a sudden at six and 12 months, was actually higher in that, that kind of low um, late group that we call. And so that caused us to go back and look at these trajectories, which I mentioned before. So if you see this low late, kind of a relatively flat trajectory, and then a, a greater slope, a greater trajectory. And that's sort of the opposite of what we hear, see in the mid high, where it's more rapid in the six months and, and flatter in the second six months. And so we're hypothesizing that this is why this is, is flipping. So that actually this ruminococcus navis is greater in abundance during periods of more rapid growth trajectories. So our the overall summary and conclusions for my section, I hope I've um, convinced you that early life is important and that nutrition is a primary determinant. We found three, um, we identified three growth trajectories in this first year and those infants in the mid high, which again in other studies has shown that that pattern of growth is a greater risk factor for um, obesity, childhood obesity as, as the kids get older. So those, um, they were less likely to be um, breastfed or combined fed versus the, the mid-stable. They had that more diverse microbiota at one week, six weeks, and six months. And they had this earlier colonization. And so we started to look then as like, well, what is, is there some, you know, supporting evidence or some biological um, context. And there was, most of us in the microbiome, we know Jeff Gordon's group, and he had a postdoc, Laura Blanton, who was looking at the microbiome of um, kids from Malawi. So they had well-nourished kids from Malawi and undernourished kids from Malawi. And within their notobiotic mouse model, they were able to show that ruminococcus navis and a clostridium symbiosum Actually, when they co-house mice with these different microbiota, that these two species moved from the well-nourished to the undernourished microbiota. So they basically mice are coprophagic, so they were eating the stool, and that these two, which were not in the undernourished microbiota, when they consumed the stool from the mice with the healthy microbiota, those moved over. And then they did another study where they actually gavage those into the mice. And what they found is that adding these to the undernourished microbiota um, caused those mice to grow more rapidly and it also corrected the metabolic abnormalities. So this is a, a study which again in, in malnourished children it would suggest well maybe this would be beneficial. This could be a probiotic to promote growth. But our studies showing even this, this strong statistical association in normal healthy infants that having a higher abundance of, of the of ruminococcus navis is associated with more rapid growth. So um, I will now turn it over to my, my colleague, Naman Khan, for the next um, section of this talk. Great, thank you, Dr. Donovan. And we would love to introduce Dr. Naiman Khan. Dr. Khan is an assistant professor and the lead of the Body Composition and Nutritional Neuroscience Laboratory at the University of Illinois. And his group examines the interactions between nutrition, abdominal adiposity, and cognitive and brain health with the aim to eventually develop effective dietary interventions to mitigate the detrimental effects of obesity and metabolic risk. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Khan. Thank you so much. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, AOC North America, uh, DNS, and ASN for hosting uh, this wonderful series. It's a great opportunity for faculty and our staff, our students, to also share their research 
Uh, my group is a relatively new addition to the Strong Kids team, and we're really excited about uh, uh, working with the group. Uh, we have historically examined the relationship between health behaviors like obesity, physical activity, and nutrition, and cognitive health in older uh, pre-adolescent uh, children. And uh, with general support that we received from the NIH and NDC, the National Dairy Council, we've had an opportunity to extend this work uh, to the younger cohort in Strong Kids. So what I'll be doing today will be to just give you a brief overview of how uh, these health factors uh, in uh, older school children, but also in uh, perhaps the four-year-old age range contribute to cognitive function. So for, for background, I was hoping to first uh, highlight just some brief uh, epidemiological data that I don't think is going to surprise a lot of people, but I think it's important to take a step back and sometimes think about the lifespan a bit more carefully. So these are data from uh, the CDC just highlighting uh, the prevalence of obesity uh, and the proportion of individuals meeting fiscal activity guidelines and uh, those meeting uh, fruit consumption guidelines. Uh, it's uh, estimated that approximately 20% of children uh, have uh, obese weight status, and this often tracks into adulthood. Uh, currently, about 40% uh, of adults uh, have obesity. Uh, we also see similar uh, patterns of uh, poorer activity, of uh, percent percentage of individuals meeting fiscal activity guidelines as individuals get older. Uh, and, and we also see this in the case of people meeting guidelines for uh, vegetable and fruit consumption. Uh, while the influence, and in, you know, I, I know from the literature we are all generally familiar with, there's quite a bit of literature on the interactive influence of obesity, nutrition, and physical activity on cardiovascular health. Uh, increasingly, however, we are learning that uh, these health factors are also important for uh, cognitive function as well. So they, you know, the, the brain and, and its and its abilities are not immune to uh, all the the cardiovascular impairment or even the risk factors associated with obesity and poor health behaviors. So hopefully by the end of this talk, I'll have uh, shown you some data that would uh, give you, convince you that other, that these factors are important even uh, in childhood. So as far as understanding the implications of health behaviors and obesity uh, for cognitive function, we have focused our work on a set of functions known as executive function. Uh, executive function, which is also known as cognitive control, is a set of uh, processes that are vital for regulation of our behavior. Uh, these include working memory, uh, inhibitory control, and cognitive flexibility. Uh, working memory is the ability of uh, an individual to hold information in your mind and manipulate it. Uh, inhibitory control is uh, the ability to regulate attention and regulate self-behaviors. Uh, cognitive flexibility is often called multitasking. Uh, together, these executive functions are thought to, thought to provide support for higher order functions that we typically think about as brain function like reasoning, problem solving, and planning. Uh, what's important to think about when it comes to executive functions is that there's been, sh there's been hard data collected sh that shows that uh, executive function abilities uh, predict uh, greater long-term scholastic and vocational success as well as uh, you know, more marital success, uh, happiness as well as uh, financial plentifulness in later life, uh, less uh, risk for substance abuse uh, in adulthood. So we know that executive function in childhood can be an important marker of these real life outcomes in adulthood. What we also know about executive functions and I think is important to think about in childhood is that these are dependent, at least is proportionally dependent on the prefrontal cortex, which is a region of the brain that exhibits a protracted development all the way until the third decade of life, which allows for health behaviors uh, to have, have an impact in terms of optimizing cognitive function. So as I go through the presentation today, uh, I'll go through just the three different areas that we've done some research uh, and highlight some key studies. I'll start with uh, obesity, uh, then physical activity and fitness, and then uh, highlight some work in recent work we've done in the area of nutrition and childhood cognitive health. So one of the first studies we conducted uh, in this area was when I was a graduate student uh, here at the University of Illinois uh, in collaboration with Charles, Hill, Charles Hillman's laboratory. And uh, their laboratory had done research looking at the effects of aerobic fitness and cognitive function in school-aged children. Uh, my interests were focused on obesity, so we were able to uh, actually ask some very basic questions about the effect of obesity on children's cognitive function after we have accounted for well-known factors like aerobic fitness IQ, 
uh, and uh, socioeconomic status. So in this study, what we did is we matched students for those important co covariates. Uh, we compared healthy weight participants between the age of seven to 10 years of old, uh, 10 year olds, uh, those healthy weight versus those with obesity. Uh, we compared their performance on a go no go uh, task. Uh, the important thing to appreciate about this task is that there are two conditions. There's a go condition and a no go condition. In the GO condition, uh, participants are presented with uh, you know, one of two stimuli on a screen and they're, they're asked to respond to the rare stimulus. Uh, in this case, it was a, you know, the, the, the cartoon character of a lion. Uh, that occurs about only 20% of the time. So it's a basic attention task. It's easy to do. Children just essentially just wait until they see this the random lion show up. Only 20% of the time they can press the button uh, and then we can measure their performance. In the no-go condition, on the other hand, uh, it's actually an inhibitory condition where we reverse the instructions. So the child then is asked to respond on a response pad for the more frequent stimulus, which is the tiger on the screen. And so more, most of the time, the child is actually pressing a button. And when they see the target stimulus, which is the lion, they have to withhold their response, which actually necessitates inhibitory control. So when you compare participants for a healthy weight versus those with obesity, uh, what we learned in this study was that Children with obesity actually had uh, poor performance, especially, and only really only evident in the inhibitory control condition. So when you actually have inhibitory demands increase, when you see this difference uh, emerge. Uh, additionally, uh, we also have the capability in our laboratory to, to not only study behavioral performance uh, measured in terms of accuracy and reaction time, but also at the neuroelectric level. And we do this using uh, event-related brain potentials. Uh, these are uh, a component of the e ongoing EEG as participants do these tasks. Uh, specifically, we're interested uh, in examining the P3 ERP component. Uh, this is the component that typically uh, emerges about 300 milliseconds post stimulus onset. Uh, it's a waveform essentially with the, depending on its uh, amplitude, it gives us an idea of how much attention somebody is dedicating to a particular task. Uh, when that peak actually occurs, gives us an idea of information processing speed. Uh, so that gives us, a, you know, it allows us to go beyond simply looking at behavioral data and actually understanding uh, how a child is utilizing their mental resources as they do these tasks. So in this task, when we looked at the P3 uh, data in these participants, uh, especially when we compared the no-go versus the go condition, uh, we realized that the healthy weight children actually exhibit a modulation in the P3 index. But uh, what this showed is that essentially there's a larger difference in the P3 between the go and the no-go condition in the healthy weight participants. However, we don't see that sort of modulation in children with obesity. So this was the first study that uh, not only highlighted that there were this poor inhibitory control in children with obesity, but also that they were inefficiently uh, utilizing their neural resources as they're doing this task. However, one of the limitations of this previous work, uh, it was the fact that we relied on BMI and uh, it's well known that BMI uh, while a very useful uh, tool in terms of weight categorization, uh, doesn't account for many factors, including body composition and fat distribution. And we know from other studies in the area of cardiovascular health and uh, glucose regulation that central adiposity or accumulation of body fat, uh, particularly in the visceral cavity, uh, predicts uh, onset of uh, cardiovascular disease. And interestingly, that relationship has also been demonstrated for the onset of dementia among adults. So these are data for, this is, these are findings from uh, one of the earliest studies that was done on this topic. Uh, and uh, it was a large study that was done with thousands of participants where they, put, they followed them for over 30 years, starting in their mid thirties, and they looked at their, their diagnosis of dementia 30 years later, uh, based on quintiles uh, or categories of their different anthropometric measures. So those in the quintile five, for example, those were the, that had the highest BMI, highest substantial abdominal diameter, highest thigh circumference uh, in their midlife. And what these, these data revealed uh, was startling was that individuals who are in the highest quintile of uh, abdominal, sagittal abdominal diameter, which is essentially the height of somebody's um, uh, you know, waist, uh, the height, height of their belly when they're lying horizontally, uh, was actually the, predicted the onset, the onset or diagnosis of dementia at up to almost a threefold greater risk, even after accounting for BMI. So we know that in adults, uh, central adiposity is a predictor uh, for uh, dementia risk later in life. So increasingly, our work in children has focused on this hypothesis that a uh, you know, metabolic impairment that we typically see in adults uh, that impacts perhaps cognitive health, but also the well known for its impact on cardiovascular health, uh, may be also evident in younger children. And uh, we've done some work in uh, 
pre-adolescent pre children showing that. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight that uh, we've also done this work in uh, children as young as four years of age. So a couple of years ago, we had, uh, the, the, we had pilot funding from the National Theory Council that allowed us to test uh, cognitive assessment tools and even just ask the basic question of whether the relationship between obesity and health behaviors, whether uh, since we've observed them in older children, whether they can be observed uh, even in children as young as four years of age. So this is a recent publication uh, that we have looking at the, uh, the comparison between whole body percent fat uh, and visceral adipose tissue, both of these assessed using uh, DEXA, uh, comparing both these metrics uh, across different measures of uh, your psychological function in four-year-olds, uh, including intellectual ability, uh, expressive language, and academic skills. And what these data, these findings revealed is that when you actually categorize the participants based on their visceral adipose tissue, uh, that's when you actually see differences in their expressive language and academic skills emerge. However, not when you look at their BMI percentile or their whole body percent fat. So these data essentially support what we're seeing in older children and perhaps even in adults, uh, that visceral adiposity and central adiposity metrics are more sensitive uh, to cognitive function. And it was interesting and perhaps even a little alarming to see these relationships in children as young as four years of age. So the next few slides, I was gonna cover some knowledge that we have in the area of physical activity and aerobic fitness and its relationship with cognitive function in uh, childhood. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, there is a, as true, only about half of, the, of children uh, in uh, pre-adolescence meet the recommended guidelines for daily moderate to vigorous physical activity. This number reduces uh, by adolescence and by young adulthood, only a third of uh, individuals meet guidelines for physical activity. So several years ago, um, my mentor uh, and uh, colleague, Charles Lynn conducted the first randomized control trial called Fit Kits to address a very simple question, which was whether uh, providing children with the opportunity to meet those daily guidelines uh, would, have, would have any impact on executive function. So this randomized control trial is funded by the NIH, uh, enrolled 221 uh, children between seven to nine years of, old, of age. There was a nine month or school, after school uh, physical activity program. It took place here at the University of Illinois campus, right next to our building in, the, in one of our rec centers. Uh, participants uh, were brought to campus. Uh, you know, we, we actually had buses that, that facilitated this and participants, parents picked the kids up from school, sorry, from, from the campus. Uh, they spent you know, every day with us uh, for weekdays, about two hours or so, and in that two-hour window, uh, participants engaged in moderate to vigorous physical activity uh, and low, you know, using sports, but also some low organizational games. Uh, and the measures of this study were body composition using DEXA, aerobic fitness, uh, using a VO2 max test, and then also um, attentional control and cognitive flexibility among other measures. So what you're seeing on the right is a figure illustrating a comparison between the control group and a weightless control group uh, and the treatment group. And as expected, both groups Im uh, improve in uh, executive function measures of attentional ambition and cognitive flexibility. It's anticipated that that's, that would be the case because that's as a function of development and just growing older children get better at these tasks. However, what you see is that uh, in the group that's receiving the daily physical activity intervention, we see greater benefits in both attentional inhibition and cognitive flexibility. So this was the first study that demonstrated this using a randomized control design. Uh, since then, several other studies have come out and published uh, in similar age cohorts demonstrating the importance of provision of physical activity, uh, even over short durations, even in acute settings. Uh, and, and increase, this has actually been, uh, the provision of physical activity and benefits for cognitive function have been adopted in the recently published physical activity guidelines for Americans. But what was interesting, and I thought I wanted to just highlight because of our interest in obesity, uh, the interpretation of these findings uh, within the context of childhood obesity, I think, is very interesting. So recently, there's a publication that, uh, we, that, that I had the opportunity to contribute to where we looked at the Fit Kids data, uh, secondary data, uh, and we examined uh, the results for the neuroelectric component, as I mentioned, the P3 earlier, uh, and looking at its it, the patterns of uh, changes in the P3 uh, as a function of baseline weight status in these participants. So what you're seeing here is a topographic plot of the P3 in healthy weight versus those children with obesity pre-post uh, with the weightless control on top and the physical activity intervention at the bottom. And what's interesting is that uh, you know, 
in fact, that, that we see changes in neuroelectric patterns that are pretty similar in the groups. For example, in the physical activity inter inter intervention group, pre-post, we see patterns of increased P3, pre to post, uh, in, 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 the, in, in the children that are healthy weight. Uh, even in those in the weightless control group who start their, you know, the beginning of the year, uh, but the healthy weight, we see that progression of increase of P, increase in P3 over the course of the nine months. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that we don't see that progression in the participants who have obesity but are also that are enrolled in the control group. In fact, we don't see that benefit of P3 improving uh, over that period of development, uh, which you, know, you actually see in the children with obesity who are getting the physical activity intervention. They have patterns that are similar to the healthy weight children. So this was really interesting because these data reveal to us that uh, you know, the children with obesity in particular may benefit from, benefit from physical activity provision that would probably would allow them to you know, stay, uh, keep on track as children who are healthy weight as they go through uh, development or those that get physical activity. As I mentioned just uh, earlier, uh, increasingly that uh, it has been published work that has shown that physical activity and fitness are related to cognitive function in older school children. However, the literature on preschool age children uh, has been limited. So as part of the, uh, the pilot study that was supported by the National Dairy Council, we were interested in also examining whether the relationship between aerobic fitness and executive function can be demonstrated in children as young as four years of age. So in this study, we assessed cognitive flexibility uh, using a uh, hearts and flowers switch task. Uh, this task is relatively simplistic, but it can be challenging depending on the rule sets you apply. So uh, it's a computerized task uh, in one condition called the hearts task, participants are required or asked to simply press uh, left or right on a response pad based on where they see the heart on the screen, either left or the right of the fixation cross. In the flowers condition, they are asked to exercise the opposite rule. So if they see a flower, uh, they have to respond on the opposite side, opposite side of the screen. And then there's a block of trials that we administer that actually mixes these trials. So this is a case where the participants have to recall the rule set changing, where if they see a flower, they have to switch to and respond to the opposite direction. They see a heart, they have to go back and respond to the, you know, the same direction as they see the, the heart on the screen. So that can be a very challenging task. And what it requires essentially is children to multitask or switch rule sets as they do it. We assessed aerobic fitness, so using a submaximal test of aerobic fitness, which is a field measure uh, called the six minute walking task. Uh, in this task, participants are asked to walk a fixed uh, distance, uh, do as many laps as they can over a six minute period. And this is the well-validated approach of uh, determining sub-maximal aerobic fitness in children. And uh, we were able to relate these two metrics uh, in the data here on the right. First, it was really important for us to demonstrate that this task actually can be executed. And then you see the data that you expect uh, in terms of just the performance across the different blocks. So as you can see at the top here, the accuracy for the hearts condition, the flowers, and the mixed. As expected, uh, the mixed trials are the hardest for children, you know, tend, the performance tends to suffer. That's because they have to exercise those different rules and remember uh, which rules are applied based on the stimulus. Uh, and then we act, when we look at the performance during those mixed blocks, called the heterogeneous accuracy, we actually see that aerobic fitness, as me measured by the number of laps that children can walk, is actually positively related to accuracy during that condition when they have to apply uh, the added, those difficult rule sets. Uh, so these data were very interesting because they were consistent with what we've seen in older uh, children, uh, but they were able to also look at you know, provide us with some valid, important tools that we could then use in future studies. Uh, in addition to examining uh, the aerobic fitness relationship with uh, the behavioral task, like a switch task, we were also interested in the P3. Uh, and you can make, we, in, this in this study, we assess the P3 using an auditory uh, stimulus, uh, which is an auditory oddball. Uh, and the stimulus were essentially just high-pitched and low-pitched tones, uh, tones, and uh, you know, one's called a target and one's called a standard. So the target is that high-pitched tone uh, that occurs more rarely, uh, and similar to what I described earlier in terms of the, the go task, which is a visual stimulus. This is an auditory stimulus, and it's a rare stimulus. So when participants actually hear that high-pitched uh, sound, you see different neuroelectric activity at a higher P3. So I have a short video here that would just illustrate the task for you.
perfect. So if, hopefully if you're, I, I doubt, I'm sure many of you fell asleep while I was presenting, so at least now this will uh, wake you up. Uh, but that's, as, as you see, the, the child responding to the high-pitched tone, uh, we expect a different neuroelectric waveform, a larger peak in the P3. So these, are, these results illustrate that during the targets, uh, the participants who are higher fit tend to have a higher P3. Uh, and when you actually compare the, the P3 during the targets versus the standards for the high-fit children, you see a bigger modulation in the P3, suggesting that uh, their neuroelectric activity also improves or increases when they actually need to do uh, the uh, the task at a, at a higher level in terms of difficulty. So these data uh, not only replicate studies in, a, in older children, uh, both for behavioral performance as well as uh, the neuroelectric uh, data. So for the last uh, few slides, I was going to highlight some work we've done in the area of nutrition um, and its implications for cognitive function in childhood. Specifically in the area of nutrition and cognition, uh, we've uh, focused our efforts uh, examining the impact of uh, what the implications of carotenoids, uh, specifically the carotenoid lutein. Uh, lutein is a carotenoid or plant pigment that's found in highest quantities in uh, green leafy vegetables, uh, but also in small but highly bioavailable amounts in uh, egg yolks and avocados. Uh, so you can think of like an avocado toast being a very you know, good source uh, in terms of bioavailability for lutein. Uh, lutein and other carotenoids have, of course, been long studied uh, for their as dietary bioactives owing to the antioxidant capacity for a variety of uh, chronic diseases and uh, health implications. They're also thought to mark a healthier diet or higher diet quality. Uh, what we know, however, it's inter that's interesting about lutein uh, is that even though it is only contributing to about 12% of dietary carotenoids consumed, uh, it's not one of the high consumed carotenoids when you consider you know, a better carotene or lycopene. However, when we look at the deposition of carotenoids in human brain samples, lutein accounts for almost 60% of uh, carotenoid content in brain. So what you're seeing on the right here is the carotenoid concentrations of different carotenoids across different cortices, and we see that lutein accumulates almost two to three-fold greater amounts, regardless of which uh, brain region you're studying. So this is really intriguing data because it tells us that something that lutein is preferentially being accumulated in brain tissue, even though it's not a big feature of our diet. Uh, and so there's been an increasing amount of research now really investigating the implications of lutein for cognitive function. We've done a few studies in the area of lutein and cognitive function in childhood and also adults, but I just want to quickly highlight a study keeping with the theme uh, of executive function and the P3. So we did a cross-sectional study a little while back uh, looking at the uh, performance of children who have higher macular pigment optical density, which is a non-invasive proxy measure of um, lutein accumulation in the eye, in the macula, and it's been shown to be a validated, uh, you know, reliable way to measure lutein that may also be in the brain, so it's a nice non-invasive way to do this. And we were able to look, what we did in this study is examine children's performance on an attentional uh, inhibition task and uh, across different levels of macular pigment optical density, or MPOD. And what we observed is that participants with higher MPOD tended to do better uh, on the incongruent task version of this task, which is a more difficult or task where we actually elicit more interference control in these participants. Uh, when we look at the P3 data that we collected while participants are doing this task, it is very interesting that uh, participants actually exhibited the higher MPOD exhibited lower resource allocation, which is a lower P3, while being more accurate, which suggested to us that they actually might be that lutein is actually related to uh, neural efficiency uh, during this task. Subsequent to that, we uh, conducted a randomized control trial that, exi that examined lutein and DHA effects. Uh, and this is based on some adult studies uh, that have been done that have showed that lutein and DHA when provided together uh, improve cognitive function in uh, older women. So this was one of the, the basis of, of the design for children. So in this study, what we did is uh, we sub we provided children between seven to nine years of age with lutein and DHA through a fortified beverage over a nine-month period uh, on a daily basis relative to a placebo. And we measured changes in macular pigment optical density as well as uh, some cognitive tasks. And what we learned was that we macular pigment optical density can improve following the consumption of lutein, even at a small dose as one milligram. And we did see uh, improvements in relational memory and attentional control in the intervention group uh, to a greater extent than the control group uh, as uh, following the nine month period. So for the last uh, two slides, I just wanted to highlight 
that uh, you know we're really excited about the possibility of, of, of working with the Strong Kids cohort. Uh, it's very important to recognize that uh, much of the work I've presented today has a lot of limitations, especially the, the, the fact that we have we're not accounting for important early life factors that can contribute to childhood health. Uh, for example, brain development uh, occurs at a, you know, at a very rapid rate early in life, uh, and by you know by two years we have almost you know, 80 percent of the, the weight of the brain uh, already. Achieved. So there's a lot that happens in the first two years of life. Uh, we also know that uh, a lot of different processes essentially shape uh, how you know optimal cognitive function early in life. So with the Strong Kids group uh, participants, we'll have data, uh, and you know, about Arden McMath will share some of so we'll discuss some of this. But we have some uh, cognitive data in the earlier stage, so two years of age, uh, and also we know that. Uh, you know, the trajectory of growth for these different cognitive processes varies in uh, in participants as they in children as they get older. So we'll get an opportunity to understand the longitudinal growth uh, of these processes and the extent to which the factors I've discussed today, like lutein, uh, weight status, and uh, body composition, may have implications. Uh, in the case of lutein, uh, what we know is that uh, it's more viable than breast milk, and we know that infants who receive uh, breast milk or formula with uh, lutein in it tend to have greater uh, serum lutein status. So we know that these factors are important uh, to consider when we're interpreting even um, relationships later in childhood. So the summary slide or the conclusion for my presentation, uh, hopefully the, the data have convinced you that uh, obesity may have negative implications for cognitive control or executive function uh, in uh, children, pre-adolescents as well as four-year-olds. Um, we see this, that there's a consistency there, and we, we can see that these relationships emerge even earlier now. Uh, we're looking forward to doing the work with the Strong Kids cohort uh, because it has a potential to address really important questions about growth trajectory, uh, the changes in nutrition and early feeding, but also it allows us to look at cognitive function within the 60s, 60s model. Uh, so that's really something that hasn't been done in literature is looking at how health behaviors impact cognitive function while considering factors like genetics, like microbiome, also family and, and beyond that. So this is going to be a really great opportunity to really expand the pie when it come, come to, comes to explaining the variability in cognitive function using health behaviors. Thank you. Great. So with that, go, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to introduce the next speaker, but maybe have a couple more comments. Oh, no, I'm okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Khan. Um, then to introduce our final speaker, that is Arden McMath, and Arden is beginning the second year of her doctoral studies in nutritional sciences this fall. She previously attended Miami University of Ohio, where she earned her BS in dietetics and then her MS in exercise and health science. She is co-advised by Drs. Donovan and Khan, and we welcome Arden today, and we look forward to hearing your, about your work. Thank you, Marie. So as she mentioned, um, and Dr. Khan mentioned, I will be presenting on the aims and preliminary analyses of relationships between anthropometrics, health behaviors, cognitive control, and the gut microbiota in preschool age children. So um, briefly, just to cover what I will be talking about today, first I'm going to go through what we know already about these relationships between weight status, health behaviors, cognitive control, and the gut microbiota. And then I'm going to go through um, how this led me to some questions and some aims that I have for the Strong Kids 2 cohort. And then I will cover some preliminary findings of some analyses I've done in the two-year-olds. And then finally, I'll wrap things up with uh, some future directions. So um, just to briefly sum up what we've learned so far from Drs. Donovan and Khan, we know that weight status, diet, and physical activity have implications for cognitive control. We also know that early life diet has roles in modulating gut microbial colonization and function. Um, aside from the work presented by Drs. Donovan and Khan, though, um, evidence also suggests that the gut microbiome may have an influence over health in the long term. Taking, for example, the study by Stanislavski and colleagues who showed that the gut microbiome at two years old explained 50% of the variance in BMI at age 12. So this may tell us that the gut microbiome may be important for identifying children at risk of overweight or obesity and um, may be important for subsequent prevention efforts. 
And while the explorations of the gut microbiome relies heavily on work in animal models and adults, um, there have been several studies that explore this in children. Specifically, Carlson and colleagues were among the first to explore these relationships in a longitudinal analysis. Um, they found that gut microbiota composition at age one was associated with cognitive function at age two. And specifically, they found that Bacteroides species were associated with higher scores in the areas of language development, IQ, and inhibitory control. And this study is important because it uh, provides evidence for the gut microbiome's possible role in cognitive function trajectories. Another important study that I wanted to cover published earlier this year evaluated behaviors associated with cognitive control and executive function. And what they found is that there were relationships between specific taxa. So um, as I was saying, um, another interesting uh, study published earlier this year found that um, these behaviors that were associated with exec executive function um, were correlated with specific taxa and functional genes that have already been linked to cognitive health. And um, also what was interesting about both of these studies is that they found that the species Bacteroides fragilis um, exhibited the strongest associations with behavior and cognitive function. Um, and Bacteroides fragilis is known to be um, have some protective roles against pathogen-associated inflammation, which may be the mechanism by which this occurs. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to mention is that um, that second study by Flannery also showed various associations between butyrate-producing bacteria and behaviors um, with mixed results. So in animal studies, butyrate is pretty widely regarded as having a positive effect on cognitive function. However, in this study, two of the three butyrate producers were associated with poor behavior outcomes. So um, therefore, more explorations on the effects of butyrate on cognitive function, especially in children, are needed. So while um, explorations in the gut-brain axis, oh, sorry. <laughs> myself. Um, so with the background in mind um, and using the longitudinal strength of our Strong Kids study, these are some of the questions that I hope to address um, with the Strong Kids 2 cohort. And I believe that these are particularly important um, because they may be indicative of early intervention for preventing childhood obesity and resulting cognitive deficits. And it will also allow us to understand if there's a particularly crucial time that children are more susceptible to cognitive de deficits that are dependent on modifiable behaviors. And specifically, I think that the 24 month uh, age is especially interesting because um, this is when the child has substantial developments in neurocognitive function and the gut microbiome, um, not to mention they're also forming independence from their caregivers. So they're, about, um, they're developing habits of their own. So in order to answer these questions um, I have about the cohort, these are some of the measures that I will be using for the two-year-olds. So I'm gonna be using the weight for length Z-scores as recommended um, for zero, zero to two years. I will be using the behavioral rating inventory of executive function, also known as the brief P to assess cognitive function. And I'll go into more details on that here in a minute. And for diet, um, we looked at their intake with a food frequency questionnaire um, that asked about their intake within the last six months for physical activity um, and fitness. And well, for physical activity and sedentary activities, the uh, surveys used for this were previously validated and specifically asked about the number of activities performed in a week. Um, and also the common sense media survey for media uh, asked about the amount of time spent using various screen devices, including video games and watching uh, TV, DVDs, shows on various devices and things like that. Um, and then last but not least, the gut microbial composition and function will be assessed at all time points um, using the high throughput sequencing and the meta metabolite analysis. So as I mentioned, I would um, explain what, how we're assessing uh, cognitive function at this age. And while um, 
it would have been great to be able to do some of the tasks that Dr. Khan mentioned. Unfortunately, these are not possible in children this young, so we resorted to this um, validated brief P survey. And essentially, this survey asks about everyday behaviors um, that are associated with executive function in home and preschool environments. And these questions are, um, as you can see on the slide, just about everyday behavior. So how often are they overacting to small problems? Never, sometimes, or often. So um, in other words, in this case, a higher score indicates that the parent was reporting more behavioral issues. And these questions were all summed up to um, come up with these uh, subscales that you can see at the top that aren't highlighted. So the inhibit, shift, emotional control, working memory, planning, and organizing. Um, and these are all various uh, aspects of executive function. And then from those, um, the indices for executive function were computed. So inhibitory self-control, um, just as a review of what Dr. Khan mentioned, is essentially their ability to modulate responses, behaviors, and emotions. Um, whereas the flexibility index is their ability to adapt to responses um, or actions according to their environment. And then the emergent metacognition index is their ability to systematically problem solve. And then finally, the global executive composite uh, just includes all three of these indexes, indices and is based on um, their overall executive function. So in order to evaluate um, how their executive function was relating to various uh, health behaviors, I wanted to look at the, their adherence to various recommendations. And specifically, I chose the Bright Futures Initiative to, um, uh, for the recommendations. And I chose this because it uh, is supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics, and it's uh, very recent and is continually updated based off the evidence and it's widely used um, by clinicians and families. And when you Google search it, it's one of the first things that comes up with resources for uh, recommendations for these uh, aspects of health behavior. And then additionally, I also felt that uh, it was a good representation of the four ecologies proposed to interact to affect child dietary and health habits uh, and weight gain. Uh, as noted in the six C's model, so uh, they talk about aspects of cell, child, clan, and community, um, and that's all encompassed in these recommendations. Um, so the recommendations specifically that I chose to use were whether or not a child consumed at least five servings of fruits and vegetables, whether or not they limited their or their um, their screen time to less than one hour a day. Uh, whether or not they eliminated their intake of sugar sweetened beverages. And then finally, um, I used the recommendation that these children would be physically active every day. Um, and I did adopt this uh, sort of from another initiative, but also this was kind of the more broad recommendation given by Bright Futures, just due to the nature of the survey that we use to assess physical activity. Um, because it was asking about the number of activities rather than the time. So just to give you a brief overview of who our sample was at two years, um, just of note, the most of the children are of healthy weight with only 11% having overweight or obesity. And then I also wanted to point out that uh, just with as with the overall sample that Dr. Donovan presented, um, there is a disproportional amount of high socioeconomic participants in the sample, with 50% uh, of the moms reporting their highest level of education as having a postgraduate degree. Um, and household income was also factored into this score. And then to further describe our sample, the average time spent using screens um, exceeded the recommendation, uh, with 55% meeting recommendations for less than one hour per day. And of note, only 14% of the parents reported um, that these children were not being exposed to screens at this point, 
which is kind of interesting considering that the AAP recommends no exposure to screens before 18 months. Um, and the number of um, activities reported in a week was about 10 and a half. Um, and most kids, so around 75%, were meeting the recommendations to be physically active every day of the week. Um, additionally, going along with that theme, most participants were adhering to the recommendation to uh, eliminate sugar sweetened beverages. And then finally, um, kind of uh, opposite to that, the fruit and vegetable intake actually had very low adherence with only around 4% of the participants uh, consuming five servings per day. So um, the first question that I wanted to ask is at what ages are fruit, vegetable, and sugar sweetened beverages and physical activity habits linked to childhood weight status? And in order to assess this, um, as well as my other outcomes, I did use multiple linear regression um, and the covariates in this were sex, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, and birth weight for length z-scores. And the hypothesis for this question was obesity-related child behaviors, so diet, physical activity, and sedentary behaviors would be associated with weight status at two years of age. And um, what we found is that only screen time explained any of the variability in weight status at two years of all of the variables. So as um, they had higher screen time, it was associated with a higher weight for length z-score. And interestingly, uh, birth weight for length z-score did not explain the variance at two years old, but it was correlated. So the second question I had was when do health behaviors and weight status begin to show relationships with cognitive function. And um, the hypothesis being that weight for length z-score uh, would be positively associated with and predictive of cognitive function at two years of age. And what we actually found is that um, the two-year weight for length z-score did not uh, explain any of the variance in executive function at this time. My next hypothesis was that relationships between obesity-related behaviors, so diet, physical activity, and screen time, and cognition would exist at two years of age. So in other words, I wanted to know, um, since the relationships between, um, between weight status were not related to cognitive function quite yet at this age, is it simply that maybe some of the health behaviors that uh, could perhaps ultimately lead to overweight or obesity, maybe these have relationships before uh, weight status actually does. So um, what we found is that diet actually showed no significant relationships with cognitive function indices, um, but screen time was once again the variable with the strongest association. And as you can see, as the children spent more time using screens, uh, their brief P index scores increased, meaning that the parents reported a higher incidence of behavioral problems that are associated with executive function. And similar, similarly, adherence to the recommendation to be physically active every day explained a small portion of the variance in overall executive function scores, showing that those who met the recommendation tended to have a lower incidence of behavioral problems. And finally, um, we showed that there were significant differences between the mean scores of those adhering and not adhering to recommendations for physical activity and screen time um, in that chart there on the left. So my conclusions from these analyses were essentially that um, more screen time was linked to higher weight for length Z scores and a higher incidence of behaviors that are associated with poor executive function. So it um, did explain a small portion of the variance in weight for length z-scores, about two and a half percent. And then additionally, uh, we saw that it explained anywhere from three and a half to four and a half percent of exec executive function, depending on the um, index. And then we also saw that physical activity exhibited relationships with overall executive function, 
with adherence to the recommendation being associated with a lower incidence of behaviors associated with poor executive function. So another ongoing part of the Strong Kids 2 project is my work I'm currently doing with the four and five-year-olds, and I'm really excited to work with the analyses on this project, as we have a lot of objective and novel measures for this young age um, that Dr. Khan already um, pointed out to you. So um, that kind of brings me to my next point, that there were some limitations of my analyses in the two-year-olds. So for example, we used anthropometrics rather than body composition, um, which body composition will ultimately allow us to be more precise in our analyses and our conclusions since um, the metabolic functions of various tissues can be quite different. Um, and also, as Dr. Khan mentioned, uh, may have different relationships with um, cognitive function as well. So these are the uh, objective measures that I mentioned, just to kind of reiterate what Dr. Khan already covered. Um, we'll be obtaining the DEXA, um, bioelectrical impedance, we'll be doing the um, ERPs, as well as the behavioral tasks, um, and also assessing microbiome at this age. So this brings me to my last question, which, um, is does the gut microbiome modulate relationships between weight status, diet, physical activity, and sedentary behavior with cognitive function? Um, specifically, I hope to answer questions uh, that I have listed, such as are the anti-inflammatory properties of bacteroides um, or maybe the butyrate or butyrate producing bacteria, are these responsible for relationships observed with cognitive function and behavior? Um, and the great thing about Strong Kids is I will be able to explore this both in, as a snapshot in time, so cross-sectionally, as well as through a longitudinal lens. And I also hope to continue my analyses that I did on the two-year-olds in the um, ages three, four, and five. So looking at uh, what age health behaviors and weight status relationships with cognitive function begin to emerge. And um, based off the evidence present at this time, I think that these questions are really important and relevant as it may help us to not only further understand the gut-brain axis, but it may also elucidate the mechanisms by which health behaviors and obesity can impact cognitive function. And um, before I take any questions, I just wanted to quickly thank LC North America as well as my advisors um, for this opportunity. Uh, I think especially in this unique time where we're not getting to go to conferences and things, this was a really valuable experience. Um, so thank you. And with that, we'll take any questions. Great, thank you, Arden. Uh, and we do have a few minutes for questions. So um, let's just start with Dr. Donovan. We had a question here asking if you had looked at the delivery mode of children, so by C-section or natural delivery, or is that tracked in your study so that you could examine that um, at a later time with your other data? Yes, yes, well, thanks for the question. We, we do um, no route of delivery. I mentioned about 73% um, are vaginally delivered. We didn't find that it was a strong predictor, and that's consistent with a lot of recent studies that use 16S show that a lot of the differences in the um, microbiome composition kind of go away after three months of age. But I think that that might actually be a methodological issue um, because some data where they've used metagenomics or even recently even looked at phages, you could find in the same study where they didn't show differences in 16S um, at a year of age by route of delivery, they were able to show that those, those infants had different Phages. And so I think that 16S may not be sequencing deep enough. But um, yes, we will continue to look at route of delivery um, throughout all of our analyses. Great, thank you. And a question here for Dr. Khan. And the question is Were the data on lycopene in the brain from human samples or animals? And what is known about the effective age on carotenoid accumulation in the brain? So the data I presented, and I should have highlighted this, were in human infants. 
for the uh, neural tissue. So that figure that you saw on the right of that, uh, that slide was an uh, infant who, who had deceased within the first two years of life. So it's a, you know, a, a horrible you know, sort of tragedy that you know, we had you know, the, the, to those families. Uh, but it was you know, one of the first data set in human infants that actually then looked at carotenoid status. So we know now the differential accumulation of carotenoids in infants. Uh, regarding uh, you know, lycopene, in that study, they did look at lycopene and uh, it wasn't prevalent in many of the participants. It was, I think, in maybe three of the samples. So it wasn't at, included in those figures that they, they, they plotted. But it certainly does also accumulate in brain tissue, just much smaller amounts. And I, I don't know what the data says in, old, in older adults. There is some variability of age that associate, that's associated with the carotenoid accumulation. We know that in infants, and uh, at least from those data compared to geriatric tissue, there is a greater proportion uh, of lutein in the brain relative to as, you know, as the brain ages. So there's a the thought that a lot of this accumulation takes place early in life. Great, thanks. We'll, we'll just do a rotation here. Um, Arden, a question for you. Uh, one, one part is, I don't know if you covered this, but in the screen time, does that also include uh, playing computer games or is it just watching a, a shows or that sort of screen time? Yeah, so I think that was a strength of this analysis actually is we did include uh, time spent playing video games. Um, they asked about uh the child's use of even different uh modes for uh participating in these activities they asked about you know watching a show on a computer or playing a game on a computer or you know watching a show on a phone or playing a game on a phone so um i think the the survey did a good job of asking covering all the different um ways in which they could be exposed and did include video games mm -hmm. And, um, and can you speculate on what elements of screen time or screen exposure might be linked to the cognitive findings that you had, even though they weren't extremely strong? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So the um, I first became interested in looking at screen time, honestly, because I felt that it might be a good proxy for uh, their sedentary behavior. So. Um, that's one idea is that perhaps the um, the greater the screen time, the more sedentary behavior they were participating in. Although I do realize, um, you know, with the mobile phones and the kinetic gaming and things like that, that might be a little bit of a muddied conclusion. But um, yeah, I, I would say it could be a proxy for sedentary behavior. Um, but also, I, I guess I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that. Um, you know, the the greater amounts of screen time could also be sort of like a coping mechanism for parents to use um, on kids that were maybe a little, uh, had some more behavioral issues. Um, but I, I'd say the main one is sedentary behavior. So I would like to delve more into that and get more specific um, with sedentary behavior as opposed to physical activity, which we will be able to do in the uh, four and five year olds because we'll have accelerometry data. So we will um, have that sedentary behavior information. Great, thank you. And Dr. Donovan, there's just a question here about pasteurized donor human milk. And I don't know if you, have, if you know if that's been studied with respect to some of the things you are looking at or do you have any hypotheses about that? Yeah. Um, so our, obviously in our cohort, these were all term infants that were breastfed by their mothers. I mean, donor human milk, and particularly pasteurized, would be predominantly used in preterm infants. And you know, this is a really good question, and I'd have to say I should know this, but I, I'm not familiar with data that shows that infant preterms are grow differently if they're fed pasteurized donor human milk versus mom's own milk. Um, so I. We didn't study that in strong kids, and I'm not um, familiar with the, the data for preterms. Okay, thank you. And um, also for Dr. Donovan, can you comment on what elements of human milk might be responsible for the differences seen? Mm. Yeah, you know, there's there's data from um, Bert Koletsko's group that did some um, 
studies in Europe where they looked at the protein content, for example, of infant formula. Um, the issue with that study is that the protein content that they looked at was level in formula versus a much higher level. But either way, people have speculated that protein may be playing a role. Another um, aspect is potentially the human milk oligosaccharides. There's been a series of studies now that have come out, all, all pretty much associations that have associated differences in um, a mom's human milk oligosaccharide composition with growth and risk of childhood obesity. So that deserves future study. Um, although I will say the studies where they've actually added HMOs to infant formula show no differences in growth of those infants. So I, th I think right now the work in, with that is associations. Um, in terms of fat content, most of that data suggests that with higher fat content that infants actually self-regulate. And if milk has more fat and more calories, they actually voluntarily consume less um, formula. So infants are really good at self-regulating uh, breast milk. But, you know, so I think if I were to, to put my, uh, my hands on something at this point, it might be the HMOs, but, you know, human milk is a complex matrix and we don't fully know, you know, how these components might be interacting. Great, thank you. And Dr. Khan, um, looking at your um, data related to the association between adiposity and cognition, do you have any idea what the underlying mechanism might be there? Uh, yeah, so the literature on the mechanisms is limited, and I think because of you know, the nature of obesity and its path, of it, it, the, the mechanisms that are implicated with obesity and even other diseases is oftentimes complex, and it's not probably one aspect. Uh, pre, it's, it's probably not going to be straightforward. Uh, based on animal studies, we know that obesity is related to neuroinflammation, which directly impacts brain structure and function. There's also literature uh, on obesity's impact on brain-derived neurotropic factor and other uh, neurochemicals that are involved in, uh, in, in, in brain development. So there's, the, that, there's that potential mechanism. Uh, it's also not clear whether the effects of obesity are really more driven by the health behaviors like physical activity and nutrition uh, that are really driving those effects. And I think increasingly we're learning that, at least from animal models, that saturated fatty acids and you know, a westernized diet pattern can be problematic for uh, you know, memory function, uh, at least in preclinical models. Uh, in humans, it's, for, it's really complex. Uh, certainly, uh, it's thought that obesity may impact the normal aging process and, and, and by you know, impacting um, then in, the, in terms of just oxidative stress in the brain over time. Uh, so in older adults, that's a possible mechanism. Uh, in children, however, it's probably more complex because there are also psychosocial factors. So children who are even, even if obesity may have some metabolic implications, we know that children who are, you know, who are perceived to have overweight are often subject to teasing and isolation, and there are, you know, all these other factors could also impact that stress and anxiety, and isolation could also impact their, ability, their cognitive function and, and some of their achievement scores. So the, it's a good chance that this is actually a very complicated mechanism, and I think it's also important to be very sensitive to this topic in general because we know that the the link is probably not very strong. Uh, obviously, you know, if there was a strong link between obesity and cognitive function, given that almost 70% of adults in the United States now have elevated BMI, that would be a really, really serious issue. Uh, it's a, it's what is, I think, a, way to, a better way to think about obesity and cognitive health is to think about it much like a risk factor uh, in any other uh, you know, domain when you think about obesity and cardiovascular health uh, risk, for example, where it's not the case that everybody with obesity is going to have impaired cognitive function, but for individuals who do, on, do go on to have some cognitive impairment, obesity is part of that pathophysiology. Great, thank you. I think we're actually at the end of our time today. So um, we really wanted to thank Drs. Donovan, Dr. Khan, and Arden, as well as, as all of the University of Illinois speakers that we've had over the course of the series for talking with us. And we just want to remind everyone to turn the slide, check out our website for future events. We've got some things going on at FENCI and IAFP. And we also have a quite significant video library on all different kinds of nutrition and food safety topics. And we welcome you to check those out. So thanks everyone. Thanks again to our speakers and we hope you have a great afternoon and weekend. Thank you. Thank you.